Hello and welcome to Life Church Today. Life Church Today wants to make a lasting difference in your life, in our community, and in the world. Our mission is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's how Life Church Today is able to make a difference in the lives of so many people, and it's the motivating dynamic behind everything that we do. You see, church isn't merely a building, it's the people. So we aim to bring church to you. We meet around the globe online and in physical locations throughout America. No matter how and where you join Life Church today, you'll find friendly people who are excited to get to know you as you become part of the Life Church family. And wherever you are in life, you matter to God and you have a purpose to fulfill. Life Church today wants to help you become the person God has created you to be. Every journey, including yours, has a next phase and will help you discover it. It could start with simple things like serving, praying, or writing, finding God's vision for you. You will not have to take the next step by yourself. With a solid community of friends, you can smile, grow, and serve with people who sincerely care about you. Enjoy the sermons, read the devotions, reach out and contact us. We respond to every single person who writes us or find a group to join you on your faith journey. Worship, give, and love. Our community and world. We are excited about serving the world's community and offering God's love to people of all backgrounds, whether online, in person, individually, or in groups. Within our church and around the globe, we are focused on supporting and engaging in relationships that provide assistance and restoration to the hurting world. Our caring leadership team, including lead pastor Mike Robinson, works together to shape the vision and direction of Life Church today. Pastor Robinson, author of 40 books, serves with a team of enthusiastic and educated ministers using their numerous years' experience. They aim to serve you and your whole family. Visit lifechurchtoday.com.
Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you for the cross that you have carried. Thank you for your blood that was shed. You took the weight of sin upon your shoulders and sacrificed your life so I could live. that you have carried thank you for your blood that was shed you took the weight of sin upon your shoulders and sacrificed your life so I could live now nothing is holding
you're the king upon the throne. Thank you for the way you've always loved me. And now I get to love you in return. Now I get to love you in return.
So I wonder how many people here have been to a wedding, and I'm sure that most of us have. Um, there's a lot of variations of different ceremonies out there, and lots of different cultures and religions, beliefs can alter the way that a ceremony proceeds. But there's one moment that occurs in pretty much every one. It's that moment when the chord strikes and you hear that familiar tune, the da 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 and you know that means that the bride is about to enter the room. There's a hush that falls on the crowd. And typically everybody will rise to watch the bride come towards her groom. 
may watch to see the love and the intimacy that passes between the couple in those moments. They look to see her walking in purity and in innocence and in love. Here comes the bride, all dressed in white. And I know many of us would recognize that familiar tune if we heard it, but have you ever actually heard the lyrics? The first stanza goes, Here comes the bride, dressed all in light. Radiant and lovely she shines in his sight. Gently she glides, graceful as a dove, meeting her bridegroom with her eyes full of love. You know, there's many places in Scripture where the church is referenced as the bride of Christ. In Isaiah 54, 5, we're told, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. In Revelation 21, 9, 10, we see John, the Apostle John, receiving a vision from one of the seven angels holding a bowl with the seven last plagues. And he speaks to John saying, Come, for I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And John was carried away by the angel, and he was shown the holy city of Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God. And in Revelation 22, 17, it speaks of the church's cry, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Now at this moment, we're really not radiant or lovely. But he's forming us, and he's preparing us to meet him. One day, we will glide towards our heavenly bridegroom with eyes full of love. But for now, we're preparing for that marriage supper and our eternal union with our Savior and King. Now, many might find it strange to reference the Lord in such an intimate manner. I know when I first came to Christ, I thought it was odd, this inter interpretation of us being married to God, or the Lord being our husband, or the Lord being the lover of our souls. But our relationship with God in this reference is not like that of a man and a woman on earth. Um, it, it's really the communion that was meant to be from the beginning. An uninterrupted, uncorrupted, holy union of spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. This is just like when God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, he fellowshiped with them on a daily basis in an intimate manner, one to one. They saw him, they heard him. And that's what God still desires with us. And so we're shown God's intention to restore that union that was broken when sin entered the world. In Ephesians chapter 5, 27, he says, So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So what will it take for us to be ready? For us to be without spot or wrinkle, because I don't know about you, but I really could stand some serious irony myself. We're all a mess. Even though we're being cleansed daily through the blood of Christ, there's going to come a day, I believe, when we will be forever cleansed, and every spot will be removed. But until that day... We are called to be preparing ourselves just like a bride prepares for her groom. We're supposed to be actively working to make ourselves ready for that marriage supper in eternity. So what are some of the things that a bride might do to prepare herself for her marriage? There's a lot of things that she's probably going to do in preparation for her wedding day. She's going to look for that perfect dress. She's going to make sure that the venue and everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. She'll go and have all of these pre-wedding rituals and have her nails done and her hair done and all different things. But there's one thing that she's specifically going to do on her wedding day. She's going to spend lots and lots of time in front of the mirror, making sure that her hair is just perfect, that her makeup is just perfect. She's going to make sure that her dress is perfect. And if there is a spot or a wrinkle on her dress, everyone is going to stop and make sure that that is taken care of because she will not walk down to meet her groom with a blemish or with a spot. And she's going to make sure that she's beautiful. She's going to take great pains to ensure this. So on the day of her wedding, she's likely going to spend a lot of time in front of a mirror 
staring at her reflection and primping until she feels satisfied with some level of perfection. Now scripture tells us that we are all looking into mirrors on a daily basis. Corinthians 13, 12 tells us, For now we see only in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face, referring to eternity when we will see the Lord. And in James, where he states in chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, he speaks of people who were hearers of the word and not doers, saying that they are like a man who stares intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once he forgets what he looks like. So what does this mean? It means that we can spend all of the time that we want staring into mirrors, both physically and spiritually, working to make ourselves perfect for both man and for God. Or we can just simply submit to his divine work in us, his perfecting work, and then therefore we see his reflection coming out in us. So again, a bride is going to want to be beautiful for her groom, and just like in the song lyric, she's going to glide gracefully down the aisle towards her groom. So how do we begin to prepare ourselves for this eternal wedding celebration? I believe that there are three specific things that we can do to be in a position of readiness. And the first thing that I believe we should be doing is being in submission to the work of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be gently nudging and prodding us along daily. He woos us just like a suitor woos his love. He wants us to spend time with him. He wants us to allow him to shine his light into our dark places. And submission seems scary for a lot of people because they see it as a loss of control. They see it as some type of power over their lives, as a form of oppression. But the truth is, submission to the Lord is freedom in its highest form. There is glorious freedom in letting go of not trying to oversee things that you really can't control anyhow. Any person who really believes that they're in control of their circumstances is actually a bit delusional. Because we can't guarantee our next breath. How in the world can we stand in control of the vastness of our own lives? But willingly laying down our need to work or to fix or to make things happen allows for such freedom and joy to come in and it gives room for the Holy Spirit to come in and work in our lives. Now submission is not just laying something down, it's also preparation. By submitting to the Holy Spirit, we're agreeing to follow His orders. When He prompts us and when He shows us things, we agree to obey. We agree to rid our lives of these things that He reveals to us. And Scripture gives us a striking picture of the difference between prepared brides and unprepared brides in Matthew 25. Five of those ten virgins He speaks of prepared themselves, they readied themselves, they made sure that they had the necessary things to be able to go forward when they came, when they were called to meet the bridegroom, but the other five were not. And when it came time for the bridegroom to arrive, they began to beg and plead with the five who were prepared to, to give to them so that they might have enough. And the five that were prepared said, no, we, we can't, we, we have enough for ourselves, we've readied ourselves, we can't ready you. I don't believe that that necessarily is speaking of our loss of salvation, but I do think that if you have truly accepted Jesus as your Savior, it bears asking, how can you help but submit to Him when He loves you so much? Now the next thing I believe that we need to do in readiness is uh, to be uh, ready for this is through deliverance. We begin, as the Holy Spirit illuminates areas of our lives that are impure or unclean that need to be dealt with, we're going to need deliverance from some of these things. 2 Corinthians states, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's freedom that comes with submission. And there's freedom that comes from being delivered of things that bind us up and tie us down to this world. There are chains and strongholds 
that need to be broken from us, things that we carry that weigh us down and they're going to prohibit us from running this race of faith like we need to. Each one of us individually should seek God and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things to us that need to be laid down. Areas of our lives that may be gray, things that we probably know we shouldn't do or say or involve ourselves with, but we find excuses for. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 12 says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, perhaps there are things that you have the right to do, and God's not going to take them from you if they're not causing you harm, per se, but they are probably not beneficial to you. You know, they may not be helping you in your growth. They may actually be holding you back. If we really want to walk in purity before the Lord, if we really want to see the power of His kingdom unleashed on this earth through us, then we have to be prepared to submit to the deliverance of these needless and often harmful things that are in our lives. And that leads me to the final point, which is refinement. You know, once we have submitted to the Holy Spirit and He has begun to deliver us from some of these things that tie us down, He can really begin this process of refining us. Amen. Just Amen. like a silversmith takes untouched minerals and he heats this metal and he heats it time and time again and he makes the temperature a little hotter and a little hotter and each time he heats this metal a little bit more of the impurity rises to the surface and he can skim it off and a little bit more of the impurity rises and he can skim it off it is not something that's going to happen overnight it's something that happens over the course of time this is the ticket to this. The silversmith never leaves the metal. He is in constant observance of what is happening through this refining process. A potter never leaves his clay on the wheel. Amen. He is constantly, masterfully molding and shaping this, this clay to be what it needs to be. The silversmith is constantly working with this metal and making sure that it doesn't get too hot, it doesn't singe, it doesn't burn. He is watching it and he is making sure he oversees this process. Just like this, Jesus is never ever going to leave us alone in this process of refinement. He is stays close as hand. But we need to be in that fire. We need to be refined through the fires of life. We need to lose sometimes. It's not good for people to win all of the time. This generation of participatory awards and everybody's a winner, this teaches us nothing. It does not teach us how to lose gracefully. It doesn't teach us how to depend on God to help us go through a trial or something like this. We learn our greatest lessons oftentimes through times of loss and defeat. These are the times that drive us to our knees. And we need to understand the joy of letting things go. Of dreams or desires or of things or people, whatever it needs be. If we truly want to be preparing to meet Jesus, becoming more and more like him every day, then we're going to be willing to submit to the deliverance of our souls through the fires of refinement. And I want to say that again. If we truly want to be preparing to meet Jesus, becoming more and more like Him every day, then we will be willing to submit to the deliverance of our souls through the fires of refinement. Amen. Amen. There's a beautiful song that was written by Brian Dorcason, and many of uh, you would probably know it if you heard it. It's called Refiner's Fire. The whole song is beautiful, but the chorus is really the cream of the song. It says, Refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. 
Is that really your heart's one desire? Do you desire to be set apart for the Lord, submitted and ready to do His will? Everyone who submits to a master must go through a process of preparation. We have to be mm -hmm. trained and ready. We have to be rid of any baggage or claims that were previously held to our lives. Right. We must be solely and completely focused on service to our master. Mm -hmm. But we have such a more intimate and beautiful promise because Jesus doesn't simply want us as servants. He wants us as companions for all eternity. And it's a daily process that we are never going to arrive at this side of heaven. Nobody is perfect, but we're told to seek after it. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us to be holy as He is holy. He tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. And we do this by submitting ourselves to that fire and being refined in love and care by Jesus, who is the master artisan. He is the one who is lovingly and painstakingly crafting each one of us into the bride that he wants us to be. There is a corporate bride, which is the church. But he also responds to each one of us individually as the love of his life, the ones he died for, the ones that he longs to be with in relationship for eternity. And it's our responsibility as believers to be actively growing because it's not a spectator sport. There is no bench in Christianity. It's an all-out battle for your own personal spiritual growth and the growth of those who God puts within your circle of influence. So what will you do? If we obtain salvation and nothing more, if we don't prepare ourselves to meet Him, and if we waste our days, what shall we say to our bridegroom who has been preparing a place for us all along, yet he was not important enough for us to prepare for? And there's still time. You can begin today. You can begin today to submit to the fire. You can begin today to be ready and wait until he can see his reflection in you. You can let him cover you with the oil and the perfume of His presence so that you carry it out into the world. You let Him raise up the dross and the sludge from your heart and your life and make you light and fit for travel and service. And you let Him put a song in your mouth in order to offer Him worship and praise. I want you to remember one thing if you don't take anything else away from this message, which is that Jesus loves you loves you regardless. He died for you. He cares for you intimately. Regardless of how you respond to this message, He loves you. He died for us when we were wretched and vile and filthy in our sin. And He will love us still if we do absolutely nothing for Him. But friends, what will you do on that day if we stand unprepared? Which face of the bridegroom would you prefer to see? The one that beams with love and pride for his stainless bride? Or the one that beams with love but is clouded with a shadow of sorrow because his love and care was simply not enough to motivate?